Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. We are powering through October. Here's hoping you've been able to get some field work done as well. And beginning this week's broadcast, the latest USDA crop progress report reveals 20% of Nebraska corn and 28% of Nebraska soybeans have been harvested. And according to the USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service, Nebraska corn stocks in on-farm storage increased 30% compared to last year. For soybeans, those on-farm stocks skyrocketed by 91%. Now, the change in stocks may suggest grain storage is a strategy farmers are using more than in years past. This week, I was joined by Oklahoma State University's Dr. Carol Jones. She's one of only a handful of grain storage engineers in the U.S. and tells me storage is a little different where she is than in Nebraska. A lot of our products are the same, but Oklahoma doesn't have near as much on-farm storage as you do here in Nebraska. In Oklahoma, we're a commodity state where we harvest it, take it to the local elevator, and it goes into the commodity market from there. Where here in Nebraska, I see an awful lot of on-farm storage. Some of your family farm storage is as big as our commercial storage. What are some general rules to follow when it comes to grain bin storage? Does it all come down to just keeping that grain the right temperature? keeping it dry, what other recommendations? That really is the basics, uh, temperature and moisture. If you can manage those two things, you, you've got a leg up on the game. But there's some other things you need to think about, and it's that your marketing strategy is one thing to keep in mind. Are you gonna handle this long term in your facility, or is it gonna move out in the next month or so? Uh, you can handle something a little wetter if you're not gonna store it as long. So it comes down to marketing. It's all one big system. Everything that you do and the decisions you make in a grain facility all plays into the quality of that product and the safety and the environment and how much money you're gonna make. And here in Nebraska, we've had a very wet growing oh, yeah. season. Uh, I know you said in Oklahoma, it's been a, a little wet for you guys. Not, not near like not, you've not, had. Not nearly like what we've had. <laughs> no. But what are some recommendations for before you store that crop that may have a little more moisture than what it should? Yeah, again, back to marketing. If you're wanting to store something for a long period of time, you might want to rethink that this year because it's, it's going to be wetter going in, and that's always causes us some problems. Planning to monitor is just really important this year. Uh, we've just pulled out all of the stops on monitoring everything you ever thought you knew about holding grain. This is your year to practice that because we're going to have some challenges. How often does the grain need to be checked by the farmer once it's stored? If, uh, if you're over about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature's over 50 degrees, I would check it every week if you can, every couple of weeks at least. Um, now when we get into the winter, when it's colder out, that grain's a lot more stable. So you can go once a month. But uh, when, it's, when it's warmer and the insects have the potential of being active and mold depend, uh, depends on where you're at in the state, but mold will develop more over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So checking it weekly is a really good plan if you, can, if you have the time to do that. And if all the precautions are followed when you're storing it grain, how long is it going to last? Or is it eventually going to go bad? Oh gosh, if you've got everything, if, if, if it's dry and everything is in place and good quality, you can store it for years. It really is a stable product. Uh, that first year is the most critical. Uh, but if you're keeping an eye on the insects and they don't invade and it's a dry climate or dry atmosphere in the bin, you can score for, store for several years. We've got more information on the research Carol is doing on the Market Journal website and an extended interview with Carol is on our YouTube page. Next up, whether you're continuing to harvest or in some cases playing the waiting game, it's always a good idea to be thinking about your cost of production for next year. And good news, a new tool is in development to make those calculations a little bit easier, regardless of what you grow. Nebraska Extension educator Glennis McClure gave us a sneak peek of the new Ag Budget Calculator. 
it's really going to be a great way for them to customize, to put in their data, their records, their information, and uh, get their own cost of production information back from that. So we're still in development of that, but we're really, really close to having phase one of that um, to roll out. And so, um, you know, we've got someone working on it and we continue to, um, you know, um, make it work and try to make it user friendly. And I'm asking some of the producers to provide feedback on that um, because, again, it's in development. And so um, I think it's going to be a great way for folks to put in like their different operations and then tell us about their material costs for phase one anyway. Tell us about their material costs and, the, and their um, equipment that they're using for the different field operations. And we'll be able to have a, some, you know, cost calculated from that point of view. And beyond that, we have more planned, but phase one is what we're really focused on right now. We'll provide more updates on the Ag Budget Calculator as we get them and once the 2020 Nebraska crop budgets are released, we'll have Glennis back on the show to break that down for us. Next up, some cattle producers call it windrow grazing, others call it swath grazing, but no matter the name, the benefits are the same. This management practice lowers harvesting and feeding costs by a pretty significant number. Nebraska Extension educator Dr. Aaron Berger has researched the topic for years and joined me to explain more. Yeah, windrow grazing is a scenario where we go ahead and put that crop in the windrow, but instead of wrapping up in a bale, we actually leave those windrows in the field and then we go out and we ration those windrows to the cattle, usually giving them anywhere from one to three or four days worth of feed. So the real advantage of windrow grazing is first we're going to reduce our harvest expense. If you think about it, we've got the cost of windrowing that crop, but we don't have the cost of baling the crop hauling the bales out the field and then hauling the bales back to the cattle. Another benefit is that when we're winter grazing, we're returning all the nutrients from that crop right back to the field that it was grown on. So that can sure have some fertility benefits to us in subsequent crops that we grow. Another thing would be labor. If we think about it, we can go out with a temporary electric fence, it might take us 20 minutes to put that up and that'll feed the cattle for anywhere from one to three days. And so we're also not running equipment. So that's some advantage also. We think about some of these annual forages that we've grown this year, especially on prevent plant acres, some of these sorghum, sorghum sedans that are maybe very tall, getting those wrapped up in a bale could some, be a real challenge for us in terms of getting them dried down to a place where we could really store them well. However, in Winrow, in the fall of the year, typically we have cool, dry temperatures, and that really lends itself to preserving that, and we can grow those windrows on into the early part of the year. And so just as a way to reduce cost and maybe utilize a forage in a way that can reduce some labor for us. Are there some forages that work better with this than others? Yeah, I think these annual forages are ones that work pretty well. Uh, these grasses, they tend to lose their quality less than we would with an alfalfa. Although that having been said, for folks who might have a late alfalfa crop, that they might uh, think about windrowing in say mid-October, windrowing that crop, putting it in the field and then grazing that can be a way to get that crop utilized well. Uh, reduce some of the loss that maybe we would have if we were just grazing the aftermath standing. After a hard freeze, alfalfa pretty quickly tends to lose its leaves, but if we had it in winter, we can maintain that longer and get more utilization out of it. And then precipitation patterns are going to be different throughout uh, different parts of the state. How does that impact things? Yeah, so as we think about where we're at in the state, probably the further east you go, the more challenging it is to use this. Probably want to have your window of utilization be more quickly. We get to the western part of the state. Uh, there's folks I've worked with that windrow crop in September might not use it till the following March. We have a high, dry climate that tends to be cool. So I think where you're at in the state, the crop you have sure can dictate how well this would work for you. Do you think from the folks you've talked to, is this something that a lot of farmers know about or something they consider? Or do they just say, uh, I've been bailing forever, I'm just going to keep doing that? Well, I think it has some limitations. Obviously, if you're going to windrow graze, you need to have a water source there and you need to have some fence. So there's places where logistically the challenge of that makes it pretty difficult to put in place. You know, I think also they think about a windrow in the field in the summertime and they think, ah, it turns into junk. Why would I want to do that? I think the important thing is, remember, we're changing the time of harvest. We're moving to a more cooler, dry time where really that lends itself better to a windrow grazing scenario. Once we get into the fall and we get some cold temperatures, mold growth, some of the challenges that happen with a summer type scenario are not as much of an issue for us. You'll find a guide discussing strategies for windrow grazing on the Market Journal website. Moving from cattle grazing to cattle markets, and on Wednesday we took a trip to Seward to visit with Mike Briggs over at Briggs Feed Yard. And I started by asking how the uncertainty with corn prices and corn yields is changing his approach to business. It's really been difficult 
you know, because a lot of pe people are really expecting a rally and you don't get it. So if you've bought a lot of corn out front thinking, hey, this thing's going to go up, corn actually backed up pretty bad. So you were in kind of a bad ownership position now. And then and then it gave you a chance to get some more ownership if you felt like it. Now it's kind of started to ratchet up. I believe we're going to continue to ratchet up. I believe we've probably seen as big a crop as we're going to see. And it's just going to get smaller from here. My biggest concern is, and the biggest question is, what are harvested acres really going to be? All that flooding and everything, and the government keeps coming out and saying, all these acres are there, all these acres got planted. Well, but we're, we're going to have to probably wait till January to the final crop report, but I just don't think the crop is going to be as big, so I think you're going to want to have a little corn around you, especially if you're buying, buying a lot of cattle, you need to have your corn, you, corn needs probably locked up. Has the market recovered from the Tyson plant fire that we saw or still feeling the effects of it? As of yesterday, the market finally recovered to the same level it was before the fire. Um, I think the market's in pretty precarious situation here. We've had, after we had the big hard down, we've gone pretty much straight up, haven't backed it up at all. And my biggest concern is the reason we've been able to muddle through this is Packers added Saturday, full day Saturday slaughter. Well, okay, that's great, but where is the point where the linchpin comes out and they go, ah, we're not going to slaughter anymore on Saturday. That's going to be a problem right away until that other plant comes back up online. And they're still telling us that's going to be out to the first of the year. So we're in a really precarious supply and ability to, to process that supply situation because we've got a little bit more supply than we have actual slaughter capacity at this time. Now, at this point, we've gone through our biggest supplies and we're becoming, having a much better shot at equilibrium. But the thing is, we're so razor thin, it could be another fire, it could be a cooler breakdown, it could be a pneumonia leak, it could be anything that shuts down another facility, and then we're right back in the bad situation again. I'm really concerned about our packing capacity as we go forward. And looking at live cattle, room to go higher here or you see a correction coming? I think we have to have a correction because, like I said, we've gone straight up. I, it doesn't have to be very dramatic. Mm -hmm. We're going into the time of year where usually we ratchet things up. One of my best indicators for demand is the, is the choice select spread, and the choice select spread yesterday was 27 bucks. That is why. That shows a lot of demand for choice product. I think packers are having trouble finding a lot of choice cattle for whatever reason. So I, demand is really good in backing us up. So long as we don't have any hiccups in our, in our economy, I think we could just keep grinding this thing higher. But I do think we're gonna have a setback here one of these days because we've just gone straight up. And uh, feeder cattle looking good to you? You know, been a lot of money lost in the feeding industry since ever starting since last January all the way to now for various reasons. The weather was a huge impact. That impacted us all through the summer. We just about crawl out of the hole and then we have a packing plant fire. Mm. So there's been considerable equity losses in the feed yard industry. And unfortunately, that stuff goes downhill. And I think these, these feeder cattle guys are gonna struggle a little bit because we're gonna have to buy feeders cheaper because we've got to recoup some losses. We've got to be able to buy some margins. And unfortunately, that's gonna put pressure on them. And higher corn's also gonna put pressure on feeder prices. So I don't, I don't think that looks very good for the stalker guy and the cow-calf guy here for a little bit. What about some things you're focused on as we get into the uh, first quarter next year? I think you've got to be really, along with this packing issue and some of the other things that is issue, you've got to be very aware of your, of your risk management. They're talking about yet another bad winter. I find it hard to believe when last year was the fifth wettest on record that we're going to follow it up with another one. I hope not. Hmm. But so you've got to be got to, you got to be aware of those things. But I think the market's good as we go into next year. So you want to be careful with your risk management. You don't want to overdo, but don't underdo either because there's an awful lot of risk in the market right now. And you're talking about risk management. Any other marketing advice you want to leave us with today? Um, I'm using a lot of options. A lot of people hate that, but I'm trying to leave my upside open. Mm -hmm. If you if you want to be a hedger. You know, I'd be a percentage hedger on the way up. I, I just think a guy's got to use risk management in this day and age. If you're running around out there just feeding cattle cash to cash, good luck to you.
Thanks again to Mike over at the Feed Yard. And next week, we'll be joined by Todd Holtman from DTN. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll be sure and pass your question along. Time for this week's trivia question, and we've got a question about chicken for you today. Here we go. How long does it take a broiler to grow from hatchling to a five-pound chicken? Is the answer three weeks, five weeks, seven weeks, or is it nine weeks? Make your best guess, and I'll have the answer after Al's forecast. Next up, pounding crops into the ground with a simulated hail machine isn't exactly an activity you would expect from Nebraska Extension Crop Protection Specialists. However, in researching the effect on crops and helping farmers make the best decisions after a hailstorm, Extension's Justin McMechan is willing to take on the task. McMechan helped beef up a concept hail machine originally developed in 1986 by the late Dale Flower Day a renowned UNL agronomist and agronomy professor. Read about the new machine and how it's being put to use in the October Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And Al, temperatures have been more comfortable this week and it's a really important time for a lot of our viewers out there. What can you tell us about what's ahead. Well, Troy, you're exactly right. We are in a critical portion of the year. This is harvest weather time, and we actually seen much better conditions this week than we did the preceding week when we had the big snowstorm up in the Dakotas. We did see the resulting cold air come off of that snowpack and kept us cool during the early part of the week, and then we finally seen the ridge take hold and move into the central United States, and we've seen temperatures rising in some very dry conditions, and we've seen a lot of harvest activity take off. Further to the east, I was in Michigan this last weekend, came back during the early part of the week. Really didn't see any activity until I got to LaSalle, uh, Illinois on the way back. Just a couple combines out starting to take on beans, but from Iowa, or for basically from the Iowa border over to Des Moines, I'd estimate two to five percent of the soybean crop was out. Much better uh, harvest activities you got west of Des Moines and in some locations well, well over 50 percent of the soybeans were out of the field. So it looks like the Western Corn Belt has been the better recipient of the of the harvest activity weather as we've been struggling to get, get a good sound week to two weeks of harvest activity weather. At least we are a little bit farther ahead of the game than our counterparts to the east. We have to deal with a couple systems this weekend but then we start to look at a dry trend that will continue for pretty much the remainder of the month. As we look at the upper air charts the system that went through the last 24 hours that brought a slight cool down in our temperatures is now will move to the east of us and we have this trough forming in the west that's going to shoot another wave over the next 24 to 48 hour period. We have low pressure at the surface stacked up over the northern Rockies and then a couple low pressure systems down in Texas. The moisture we've seen this morning is now moving to the east, very limited in its impact, but by the time we get to tomorrow that wave will start to energize and strengthen, particularly over the central plains, and we will see a surface low developing in northeastern portions of the state. That's going to bring a lot of moisture up from the Gulf and wrap around, and it looks like the most potent area of concentrated precipitation will be across the western Dakotas, and that will start to move into northeastern Nebraska as we go into Monday. So we get this big trough digging, most of the upper air low, and the associated surface low will now will move up into the western Great Lakes region and that will take the heavy precipitation to our east. So the areas that have been battling the wet conditions will continue and then on Tuesday we see that first system now starting to exit out the eastern United States. We see another wave moving into more of a zonal flow that will start to emerge and start to form a low pressure in the western North Dakota. Really not no moisture associated with this system as the main activity will be over the Great Lakes and the eastern Corn Belt, but that system will strengthen and dive toward the southeast and that will bring in some fairly reinforcing cold air into our region and in fact we will see temperatures drop well below normal with this frontal soundry but the moisture with this system looks to be very sparse to the north as surface flows to our south and into Illinois will basically rob a lot of the moisture feed and on Thursday the intensification of this trough occurs over the central plains so we get the cold air but most of the moisture remains to our east so this will be a very windy day for us here across Nebraska as the snowflakes fly to the east of us. And more importantly, as we get into the end of Friday, we start to see signs that this ridge will start to build into our region as this next energy moves well to our east. As high pressure moves in, a very, very good forecast for harvest activity. So if you look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, of course, with that trough forming to the east, keeping that cool air well in place to the east, central and eastern Corn Belt, and a warming trend 
to the western part of the state and in terms of precipitation we are looking at a very dry pattern as that upper air ridge from the west builds well over the central United States and we are looking really at the end of the month before we see any significant storm activity coming into the Pacific Northwest and impacting Nebraska. So it does look like good harvest activity weather, Troy, if we can get through this next three or four days with minimal amount of precipitation. Thanks, Al. Back to trivia now, and this week we asked, how long does it take a broiler to grow from a hatchling to a five-pound chicken? The answer is C. It takes seven weeks. Moving on, farmers and ranchers may be starting the process of weaning calves from their mothers. Now, this is a stressful time in the animals' lives, so it's worth it to follow a strategy that will be beneficial to the cow, the calf, and to you. Market Journal's Bill Dodd spoke with a veterinarian about those weaning techniques. Bill, what did he have to say? Well, thanks, Troy. Right now, we are in the middle of fall calving season, and however, while some are bringing in new fall-born calves, others are preparing to wean their spring-born herd. Now, it's no surprise that weaning can be a stressful time for calves and their mothers, but Dr. Halden Clark had some helpful advice to make the transition as smooth as possible for the cattle and their producers. There are many ways to wean a calf. The biggest goal most producers have in mind is to complete the weaning process with the least amount of stress to ensure calves are healthy and continue to make sufficient weight gains. According to a recent online poll conducted by Progressive Cattle, a majority of respondents preferred to wean their calves in the month of October or later. And there are a variety of methods that are quite effective. It's both fence line weaning and the weaning related to the nose flaps that prevent a calf from uh, nursing the cow. Both of those are ways to separate some of the stresses that occur during the weaning process. So for instance, with fence line weaning, uh, if the calf's on one side of a fence and the cow's on the other side, he, can't, he obviously can't nurse, but he's still close to his mother and so the, the uh, psychological stress of being separated from her is negated and that reduces the number of different stressors that are on that calf during one small time window. The same thing is in play with the nose flaps. I, I, both, are, both are very good, I like both of them. Uh, I think the determination is just what's easier in a particular producer situation, I think is gonna determine which way they wanna go with those. Uh, one thing to watch, sometimes on big, uh, high growth calves, those nose flaps can, uh, can be a little too tight. You just want to make sure they're not too tight in the nose. Uh, but other than that, both, uh, both systems, I think we've seen some really good success with reducing stress at weaning time. While a lot of attention is being afforded to the calves in this process, we can't forget how stressful this can be on the heifers. Once a calf is separated from its mother, the heifer's udder can become swollen with milk, causing a great deal of discomfort. This is where fence line and nose flap weaning seem to have the greatest benefits for heifers and their weaning calves. So as soon as that calf is taken away, her udder will get tight and that's very uncomfortable. That seems to really drive her desire to get back to the calf. So one thing that we notice is that in cows that uh, have gone through that while the calf is still nearby, either through fence line weaning or with the nose flaps, that goes away. And what we see is that frequently uh, when the cow is removed from the calf that's had a nose flap in, for instance, uh, her drive to get back to that calf is much reduced because uh, her udder has already resolved, like the, her uh, ability to produce milk has already resolved and that, that stress for her is gone by that point, a couple weeks after the nose flaps go in. Uh, and so her, they usually ball a lot less. They, they're not as tempted to break down fences, so it leads to a much smoother system in some situations. In the fall, weather may be a bit less sporadic than in the spring and summer months as temperatures are cooling off, making it easier for the calves to avoid heat stress. Producers should take advantage of the optimal weather conditions provided by the fall season and try to keep their calves dry as well as try to minimize commingling between the calves as well. Some of the ways to begin building a program to wean calves that is going to reduce stress uh, would be to A, start with a reasonably good forecast for the coming couple weeks. If you can avoid cold weather or rainy, especially rainy wet weather that's going to wet the hair, wet the hide, and uh, put the calf at risk for uh, more physiologic stress. If you can avoid all that and wean him at a time when he's going to have clean, dry hair, that would be ideal for, for starters. Uh, going into a clean, dry pen or out onto corn stalks or into cover crop 
All those things are going to be uh, ways to provide a good environment, a low stress environment for the calf to go into. Minimizing things like co-mingling, minimizing the number of different groups that have to be brought together during the weaning process is going to lead to better outcomes as well. That reduces uh, what we call effective contacts where uh, one calf can pass pathogenic bacteria or viruses to another calf either through nose to nose contact or contact at the feed bunk or water tank. Uh, fewer groups is going to lead to fewer effective contacts and generally uh, should lead to better outcomes through the weaning process. When you have a system in place you'd like to follow, there are several things to keep in mind as the calf becomes more acclimated to life away from its primary source of nutrition, and vaccination is at the top of that list. Vaccines are a way to improve the calf's immunity moving into weaning, which is a stressful time when he's going to be at risk for respiratory disease. Uh, the best thing I can tell you is if it's at all possible, getting those vaccines into a healthy, unstressed calf is going to lead to the best vaccine response, the best immune response. So if you can get those in two to four weeks before you actually wean the calf, that is ideal. That's our gold standard. Uh, as far as which vaccines to select, that's a conversation between you and your vet. Uh, and they can lead you in the direction that makes the most sense for your situation. Uh, but yeah, getting those in two to four weeks ahead of, of weaning is perfect. Now, among other things, it's important to provide a clean source of water that's readily available and to monitor your calves feeding intake to gauge your weaning program success. Ideally, minimizing these weaning stresses to your cattle will promote long-term health and carcass quality. And Troy, that's what I've got my eye on this week. I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Bill. Hey, before we go, keeping with the livestock theme, the Nebraska Sheep and Goat Producers Annual Conference is coming up Saturday, November 2nd at the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture Livestock Teaching Center in Curtis. Several speakers will be there to give market updates and ways to properly care for sheep and goats. All the contact information and the website to register is right there on the screen. And we're going to have more with Extension's Randy Saner next week about some things to consider if you've ever thought about bringing in sheep or goats to diversify your operation. Also next week, tips for controlling winter annual weeds. And with hemp now legal in Nebraska, we'll introduce you to one of the state's first growers of the crop. We'll see you next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.